welcome to the Divorce Women's Guide podcast, where we talk about the things us divorcees are thinking, but not always talking about as we turn our divorce into the best gift we've ever been given. And I do so with a little bit of sass and a whole lot of class. I am your host, Wendy Sterling, founder of The Divorce Rehab. I am here to support you in this transition phase of your life so you can start your new best chapter on your own terms. After all, that's what I did after my own divorce. And now it is my mission to change the conversation around divorce and help you see why your divorce like mine was the best gift you ever received. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Divorce Woman's Guide podcast. How are you doing today? It is that time of year. It is the holidays, and I decided to do a reach out to my Facebook community to ask them a question that many of them have told me that they even ask themselves in their own situations, and that is, what would Wendy do? So I decided to go out to them and say, hey guys, I'm going to do a podcast episode all around your questions. And so my community came back with some really good ones that I am going to answer for you guys today. So tuck yourselves right into wherever it is that you are, and I'm going to walk through what some of those questions are. So the first question that was asked is, what would you tell me to do to combat the voice in my head that says, I'm not enough? How many of you have heard that voice? I know I have. And so first and foremost, let me just say that we all hear that voice, okay? They're the little inner critic voices that tell us not to do something or they tell us things that we have a really hard time not believing because they are powerful, right? And many times they remind us that they're, well, they make us believe that there are things we can't do because we either haven't figured it out yet or again, we feel like we're not good enough. And it doesn't necessarily matter, uh, you know, where you are at in your process of divorce, but our minds are really powerful. And it doesn't matter if you're divorced or not, everybody's mind is really powerful. And so these voices creep up and one very common one is I am not enough. So what I would say is number one is to remind yourself of all the things that you've accomplished so far, right? We have all come such a long way and we don't give ourselves enough credit. Think about all the amazing things that you've done. Make a list, okay? You can do that either in your head or you can actually physically write it out. I actually recommend physically writing it out. And make it a list of things that you thought you couldn't do or you thought that you weren't good enough to do, right? All the things that sometimes you relied on your spouse to do, but you have learned to do them anyway, right? And that is a great reminder that you are in fact capable enough to do anything you set your mind to, right? So that's number one. Number two, I would ask you, where's that voice coming from, right? And typically that voice is coming from a place of fear. And as you all know, I talk about this all the time. Fear is not real, okay? It's not real. Fear is based on past experiences, perhaps from childhood where you did something, somebody reacted to it, and you formed an opinion based on that memory. And once you figure out, right, where that voice is coming from, or perhaps you know where that is coming from, it actually enables you to assess your situation better and then remind yourself, wait, that's not real, right? A lot of times I'll tell my clients to say and ask themselves, like, is that really true? Do I really know that to be true? And when you get yourself into an inquisitive place, it enables you to realize that that voice really isn't true. Um, And that's why uh, self-talk is so important, right? This is something that I do and teach my clients all the time is learning how and giving them the tools actually to have more positive self-talk. Um, you know, the kind of talk that you 
literally will look at yourself in the mirror um, and do these exercises. And it takes practice, right? And a lot of times we have to repeat them over and over and over again, and that's okay. And one of those phrases is looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, yes, I am good enough, right? And um, many times I'll also uh, recommend, to put, I, and I did this and I had this for so long, is actually post-it notes. I love post-it notes. <laughs> I don't know if any of you do this or not, but a lot of times I will write positive affirmations on post-it notes and put it on my bathroom mirror, I'll put it on my nightstand. I even have some here in my office. I actually have a really big poster of a lot of positive quotes that I read every single day before I start my day. And it's something that enables me to gain back control of my thoughts and to start living my life from what I know my truth is. So at the end of the day, you are good enough. You are, and I'm gonna remind you of that in this episode. Okay. Number two question is what should I do when my ex is not the kind of father that I thought he would be? So I get this one a lot and I combated this perspective myself. Um, and the first question that I always ask uh, my clients is, was he ever, even when you were married, was he even close to the version of the father that you had dreamed of, that you had hoped he would be? And 99% of my clients say, actually, no, he wasn't. And yet, when we get divorced, for some reason, we are still holding on to the hope and wish that they're going to step up now that you guys are not together. And unfortunately, that is not always the case, right? And this goes both ways, mothers and fathers, right? So I beg to ask you the question, which is, number one, were your expectations the same when you were actually married? Did they meet those expectations or was it always a constant disappointment, right? And if it was a constant disappointment, then what is it that makes you believe he's going to be different? right? What is the story that you keep telling yourself in your head that you think he's going to change? Because at the end of the day, you actually know what this person is capable of, right? So what is the story that you're telling that continues to feed this as your truth? And honestly, it just continues to set yourself up for disappointment. So what I encourage my clients to do, and this is something that I had to convince myself of and, and practiced, and now I'm in a much better place, which is this. If your other parent, co-parent, is actually being some sort of a parent to your kids, wouldn't you rather have that than nothing at all, right? I always used to say that he, my ex, you know, is not the father I had dreamed that he would be. And the way that I've modified that statement is that I know that he is being the best, best version of a father that he knows how to be, right? And I will take that, which I have shifted to be, I would rather him give 50% of what I hoped for and doing it 100% of the time, right? I would rather have 100% of that 50% than nothing at all. So I really encourage you, instead of focusing on what it is that they're not doing, focus on what it is that they are doing and give them space and have compassion that they will learn, they will figure it out. And many times too, you might still be picking up the slack for them when you've got to let it go. No, don't do that if your kids are in danger or being harmed, obviously. But you can't always control what's happening at the other house. All you have control over is what is happening where you are and you get to be the parent you want to be. So instead of focusing on what they're not doing, focus on who it is that you get to be in your relationship with your children. Okay? So I hope that serves uh, that question. Um, number three is what to do when you can't stand your kids being around the new wife. So <laughs> I totally hear this um, because as many of you know, my ex is remarried uh, and he has a baby. And so the first question that I would ask many of you uh, who are thinking that this is, you know, how you feel as well is, what is it about the new spouse that bothers you, okay? 
And I've heard that it could be because of a couple of different reasons, right? And one reason might be that you don't know how the new partner is gonna actually treat their child or what type of an influence they're gonna have on them. Um, you know, for those of us that are moms, um, you know, obviously we want the best for our children or our child. And, you know, a lot of times it's, it's you know, we get, we feel almost threatened that somebody else might replace us right and it's it's something that i had to learn for myself which is that no one's ever going to be you no one's ever going to be mom no one is ever going to be dad right and while this is completely new uncharted territory right it is territory that you get to step into right and do so from a place of putting your kids in the center versus putting them in the middle okay and a lot of times i do recommend that it's really important that the new spouse meet the parents what ends up happening is that it can give you a little bit more peace of mind going into the situation because i would bet um, many times you don't meet the other person. Um, sometimes I also hear that a big reason why uh, you don't want your kids around a new spouse is because they think that their kids will like that other parent too much, the step parent too much. And this probably sounds super childish and maybe a little bit cuckoo, but I will tell you that I know there are a lot of us out there who subconsciously believe this to be true and they don't want the new spouse in the picture because we're afraid that they're going to overstep their boundaries right so how many of you <laughs> how many of you feel that way right and at the end of the day i said this before there is no parent okay a mom or a dad will never be replaced in your kid or kids hearts no matter who your parent brings in to their life, okay? And then the final, the final reason that I sometimes hear people have an issue with a step parent is because they're not over their spouse yet. And truth be told, um, you know, it's still something we have in the back of our minds that, you know, we want that happily, happily ever after. We want the version of the family that we dreamed of, right? And obviously it's not always the case. So I want to encourage you guys um, to keep a couple of things in mind about this, okay? Number one is to just remember, okay, and have faith in the security of your own relationship with your kids. That's what you get to be working on instead of worrying about the other house, right? If you are taking the steps necessary to build that bond with your child, then guess what? No one is ever going to come close to you, nor is that even a possibility. So you get to go be your best mom or dad that you know how to be. Okay. And let me just say that if you are still in the place of having feelings for your ex, um, that's where you get to start doing the work to move past them. Right. And you've got a, you've got a responsibility to do that for not just yourself, but also for your kids, for your child. Hey, it's Wendy here. I wanted to take a quick break from the conversation to let you know about another free event I'm hosting on Tuesday, September 29th about divorce and narcissism. If you're somebody who is divorcing a narcissist or someone with narcissistic characteristics, this is something you don't want to miss. You will learn what you need to know before you divorce a narcissist, how to successfully negotiate with one, learn financial hacks, how to set boundaries and co-parent with a narcissist, and so much more. The event is free and it's live, and all you have to do is register today by visiting divorceandnarcissism.com. Again, the event is live on Tuesday, September 29th, so block your calendar today. And now let's jump back into the conversation. When you're able to do that healing, you'll be able to put aside these types of differences and you'll be able to handle things mentally from a much better place and in a place where you see what the benefit to your child can be by having somebody else in that house um, who cares and loves them.
Okay. And I know that that's hard to hear. It took me a really long time to figure that out for myself. And at the end of the day, I'm really, really just, I'm so grateful for my children's stepmom who does care about my kids. I know that she does. I may not agree with uh, how she chooses to parent my kids, but at the end of the day, at least they care. At least she wants to be a part of their life. And for that, I am very grateful for it. So another question um, that I got is, how do you let go of the hurt and stop obsessing about your spouse's betrayal, especially when they are with the person that they cheated on you with? So betrayal is a big one. And what I have found is really a, a big piece of kind of stepping into um, healing yourself. Um, and this is something obviously I do with my clients in real time is that um, you get to name your feelings. You get to have your feelings, right? And many times we try to shove them aside because we don't want to feel them. But when we actually name them, we take the power away. So in order for you to start releasing the hurt um, and what I would call, you know, being in the recovery process, you actually have to get more specific about the feelings that are coming up for you, right? And some of the common ones that I hear a lot are there's anger or sadness or surprise, um, fear, which I actually think fear is, uh, uh, I hear people say like, I'm afraid and it's, it's usually uh, like a kind of a cloud over what's really going on underneath. Perhaps you feel disgust, insecurity, shame, loneliness, confusion. And what's really important is to get really clear and identify what it is that you're feeling at any given time, right? Because until you acknowledge the feelings that are coming up for you, you're not going to be able to start the healing process, right? And, you know, many times, for instance, you may feel shock and confusion, right? Those might be the first things that you feel, obviously, when you discover infidelity. But then what ends up happening is that that then gives way to you shift into anger and disgust and or sadness and or fear. And then you may go back to shock and then you may start feeling shameful, right? So what I also tell my clients a lot is that, you know, it's not like you all follow one path, right? It's a roller coaster and each of us has our own designed roller coaster. It's not uniform. It is not a clear progression by any means. But it really is sort of this roller coaster, and you just have to ride it out. And so much of it is based on, um, you know, judgment. We judge ourselves for what it is that we're feeling, or perhaps we feel like, you know, we're doing so good one day, and then the next day we fall back again, and then we start beating ourselves up because we were doing so good the next day. You guys, stop doing that because at the end of the day, it is a process, okay? It is a process. You take two steps forward, one steps back. Sometimes it's one step forward, sometimes it's two steps back. It doesn't matter, okay? It's not a competition, it is not a sprint. You are not being timed and competing with other people. You get to take the time it's gonna take you, handle what comes up and stop comparing yourself or judging yourself, okay? Um, another thing um, outside of naming the emotions that are coming up is, and I tell my clients this all the time, you've got to try to resist retaliating. Oh my God. With betrayal, that is like the number one urge that we all have. And I'm here to tell you, please do not do that. And that can be in the form of like snide comments. Okay. Listen, I get it. You may feel angry about what happened. You may feel like they deserve <laughs> that punishment, right? But it, it isn't productive. Okay. And I'm the first to tell you I am guilty. I did many a snide comments and then I wound up feeling like crap afterwards. Right. And all it does is prolong your hurt and it delays your own healing process by doing this. Okay. Like think about it, right? You know, from experience that the more you pick at a scab, the longer you're going to have the scab or, you know, it's going to keep healing. It's going to leave a scar. Right. And retaliation is kind of like picking your scab, right? It's only going to continue to uncover the wound and cause you further pain. So please, it's something you're going to carry on with the rest of your life. The, the, the scar is going to continue to be there if you keep picking at it. So please resist the temptation 
please, please, please. And I promise you, as you work on yourself, the feelings will fade and pass and you will be so much happier by not picking fights and causing more retaliation. Okay. Something else that I will say um, to deal with the betrayal is to kind of take some time away, right? The best short-term solution is to try to avoid them as much as possible. And listen, I know when you have kids, there's a lot of communication back and forth, but the less you communicate or the less you see them, the better, right? And I also encourage my clients to stop following them on social media, okay? Think of, you know, all those feelings that I had mentioned above, right? The shock, the shame, the sadness, the fear, the anger, okay? Consider those being fueled by a fire. And at first, the fire burns strong and, you know, you see kind of like the white hot glow from the flames. And the most combustible fuel for that fire is when you come into contact with the person that's betrayed you, right? So in order for the fire to burn out, you have to stop adding fuel to it, right? Does that make sense? So take some time away and change up the way in which you communicate to enable you to calm those embers down, right? And if they try to contact you, and it's inevitable if you have kids, right? You don't have to react right away, right? You get to respond when you calm down, when you take some time, when you've had some space to properly manage your emotions and then go back and engage in a conversation with them. And what ends up happening when you like walk away from that is that your, your emotions, like the high level emotions start to fade, okay? And so that's how the fires become more embers. Um, and you'll be in, in such a better position to think more clearly and process what's going on and come from a place of responding versus reacting. Okay. And then the other thing is, you know, I would probably say 90% of my clients are dealing with infidelity. I, and that's probably because that was my, that's exactly what happened to me. But I really highly recommend that you guys ask for help. Don't lone wolf it in a betrayal. Okay. The first thing is shame and we retreat and we lone wolf. And that is the worst thing that you can be doing to yourselves. So I'm asking you guys, reach out for help, right? Because you get to talk to somebody who actually listens, who actually understands what it is that you are going through. Because a lot of times when we talk to family and friends, what ends up happening is that they actually will try to move us out of the emotion and start telling us how, oh, it's their loss or, you know, oh, well, you know, screw them and, you know, they'll get what's coming to them versus really sitting with you where it is that you are, offering you an ear, offering you actual steps to be able to move through the emotions and recover from where it is that you know you are helping you move through your emotions so many of you know I always offer a free 15 minute support call to everyone even you know anybody can access that and that's in the show notes or you can always um, go to my website and fill out a form and ask to speak to me okay you guys get to ask for help and there are tons of resources out there. And even by scheduling a call with me, I have an amazing network of friends that may be a better fit for you depending upon what I learn about your situation, okay? And at the end of the day, you guys, you'll be able to get to a place where your betrayal will be a part of your past, okay? At least for the most part. I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you and tell you that, oh, it's gonna go away forever. You're gonna be healed. You're never gonna feel anything ever again. And that just isn't the truth, okay? Now, why, why I'm saying that is because there are gonna be things that come up where the betrayal, like the wound gets exposed occasionally, but the beauty of working with someone and really working through your emotional wounds is going to enable you to actually get through them much more quickly moving forward so that they don't have that big effect on your life in such a great way as they do in this moment, okay? And then the last one, this is a little bit of a longer podcast episode today. Um, the last question is what key phrase or phrases should I say to myself when my mind slips into the past and I just need a good kick in the ass to get unstuck, which 
As all of you know, I am the good kick in the ass that you know that you need, but you can't give to yourself. So this is the perfect one for me. Um, and a lot of times what I say to my clients and I even do for myself is um, I'm very big and have a mindfulness practice. And essentially what mindfulness is, is paying attention to your thoughts without judgment. And that is really what keeps your mind in the now versus going into the past. And being present is something that is so rare, right? Because we're pulled in so many different directions by so much different stimuli, too many responsibilities, a lot of rushing around, um, or, you know, we're being pulled in a million different directions, especially those of us who have kids that are still being still going to school at home. And so what ends up happening is our mind too starts bouncing around, right? Between the past, which is, you know, you should all over yourself, you woulda all over yourself, you coulda all over yourself, right? And then the future, right? We're thinking about the what ifs, right? What might happen and what's the result? Nothing but stress. And listen, guys, it is possible for you to root yourself in the present moment and to stop pulling yourself back to the past, and then to stop obsessing with the future. And being able to focus and shut out distractions through mindfulness as actually a way that's gonna calm you down. It's gonna help you to start seeing things as they are versus what you believe them to be. And mindfulness keeps you present in the moment, okay? Planning for the future is very important, but obsessing over it and the past is counterproductive. So by practicing mindfulness, okay, acknowledging the thoughts that come up and not judging them and then asking yourself, is that true? Is that a story? Is that real, right? You get to stay present. And many times if something comes up from the past and we are practicing mindfulness, the next step out of that is flipping the script on what it is that you know to be true and then creating an attitude around that of gratitude. Being grateful for where it is that you are in this moment, right? Mindful of what is in the here and now instead of what was. And you get to embrace every single moment, moment as it comes and you get to live your life fully. You get to stay in this moment and embrace what you know to be true. And a lot of times it's as simple as just breathing. Breathing brings us back into this present moment. And so I really encourage you guys in order for you to stay in a place where your mind is going backwards, stop looking in that rear view mirror, look at what you know to be true today. And really the good kick in the ass is ultimately just acknowledge the thought, don't judge it and let it go, let it release, right? And I know that may not sound like a hard kick in the ass, but it definitely is the type of exercise that I encourage my clients to do when they get into that place of constantly looking in the past. Now, if it's something that you have done these things and they're not working for you, then I really encourage you guys to reach out and ask for support, right? I'm going to say it again. I always offer a 15 minute call and I may have a resource for you for, it could even be a book. I mean, it could be that simple or it could be learning about my programs or it could be me recommending you to one of my incredible colleagues, but you've got to act actually recognize when if it's happening more and more you get to ask for help okay i am really excited about this podcast episode i think i'm going to keep this one coming up and if you are somebody who wants to know what would wendy do you have a burning question that you would love my response to i encourage you to email me at wendy at wendysterling.net you can also join my facebook community which is the divorce rehab i put posts in there uh, when i am looking for people to contribute questions to this particular podcast episode and we'll continue to do so moving forward. So I hope that you all learned some really incredible nuggets of information today. I am so grateful for the time that you always choose to spend with me. And as always, I hope you have a beautiful day, sending you tons of love, light, and joy. Mwah! I will see you guys in my next episode. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorced Woman's Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, please share this episode with someone you know or spread the word on social media. This is how I reach more divorcees around the world and provide them with the support they need 
to create their next best life. And I would also love to continue the conversation with you. So please friend me on Facebook, join my private Facebook group, The Divorce Rehab, and follow me on Instagram at Divorce Rehab with Wendy. I'll see you next time.